Renu, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Declan. It seems like just yesterday that we did our Christmas podcast and here we are in 2024, our first podcast of the year. Yeah, great. Did you have a nice Christmas? I had a lovely Christmas. Yeah, it's still very much holiday season here in Australia, of course. Yeah, January yeah. is yeah. peak summertime, so there's really not much happening. I've done a bit of surgery this week, not as much as usual, but... Yeah, full of public holidays and it's a very festive time. And it's very quiet around Melbourne. If you've ever been here in the first week or two in January, it seems like a few million people have left and gone to the beach. Yeah. Um, and it's very, very quiet around here until in two weeks' time, the Australian Open starts and all the tourists are in for the tennis. And uh, This is the quiet between the cricket and the tennis. Yes, it <laughs> is. Um, but it's a great time while we're around to uh, kick off the year with a, a great podcast. So what we have um, done this year is decided to highlight uh, one of my favourite things that happens around Christmas, which is uh, Dr. Tony Shueri from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute tweets out this fabulous list of his top 10 GU oncology papers. And I think it pretty much always comes on Christmas Day or around Christmas It's a Christmas new Day. Christmas tradition for yeah. the last few years. So it, it's, uh, and, and it, gosh, we were just talking about how much it work it takes to create a list like this yeah it's nuts and we'll put the links uh, in the show notes it's well worth a peek at it but he puts out this great twitter thread of his top 10 geo oncology papers for 2023 for the year just gone by so it's a superb summary of all these key papers and also he started separately a few days later tweeting out a list of his top 10 translational papers and then top 10 sort of trials and progress and so on but uh, for today and not we're just for geo oncology but for all of oncology right. as well so yeah. to all our listeners uh, tony has done all the hard work for you if you're worried you've missed out on some key papers here is the definitive list yeah and so if you're cycling along on your bike or you're in the gym or on the way into work you can have a good listen to this and go and dig it out but we're going to rattle through his top 10 papers uh, uh, what are you calling it declan uh, what did I call it earlier? What, what do you call Speed it? Speed dating. Speed dating. Speed dating with Tony Chereri. What a great thing to do. And here he is uh, joining us from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where he's the chief of uh, GU Oncology. Uh, Tony, happy new year to you. Thanks for joining us. Happy new year. Happy new year. Pleasure to be back. It is really great to see you. And we should also congratulate him on his, um, his election uh, uh, late last year to the ASCO board, um, which is a, a democratic thing. It's a competitive thing, isn't it? you got to get voted in by your peers and um, you're ascending to the ASCO board for a four-year term. So congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank I mean, you that was brilliant, Tony. And, and what a campaign you had going on uh, on Twitter. And uh, you had a lot of support from all your friends in GU Oncology. So it's, yeah, it's, it's really Oncology. such a great um, recognition to see you up there. Well, you know, very, very grateful for all your help. <laughs> oh, no, so great. So Tony's joining us. And Tony, uh, uh, tell us a bit about this uh, this Twitter thread of yours before we uh, get into the, the top 10 papers. What made you do this or what, what's kind of the background to it? I, I wouldn't say I was bored. I wasn't. I think, uh, you know, before I usually take between Christmas and New Year kind of off, meaning available just by email. And uh, I meet with my postdocs, my fellows, like, yeah, I'm not going to see you for a week, 10 days, what's going on? We reminisce about the meetings at ASCO, ESMO, all the smaller meeting, and just like, what do you think the best or the top 10 papers, for whatever reason, not their positive, negative, and GUR, we go through them and just like that. Um, and then maybe four or five years ago, I have decided... Let me put these on Twitter for uh, everyone. So we started that uh, tradition and, um, you know, uh, with the help of several of my postdocs. And then the year after we did the translational paper, knowing, you know, now you have a lot of uh, clinical paper that are translational, that are not in typical clinical journal, but publish in journals such as Nature Medicine or even Nature that are pure clinical. What do you do there? So we try to separate the clinical and the translational uh, basic paper. And last year we decided, what about all cancers? And uh, we did one and we start them just before Christmas till just before uh, the new year. Uh, they take a lot of time. Like this yeah. year, I missed the top science papers, for example in all cancers. Yeah, Fantastic. It's a great resource. And uh, you are you still have a very big following on Twitter. Um, but I don't know, what, what do you think is the future of Twitter? Are you concerned it's going to disappear at some stage? It's brilliant for stuff like this. But one of the reasons we invited you on is it's important that this stuff appears in other platforms as well, like podcasting platforms. But do you think we'll, we'll still be here in two or three years time? Will there be a, a Twitter list or will you have had to, you know, deploy I, somewhere I do else? think uh, I, I do think it will here to stay. It's the fastest way this, in my opinion, uh, to yeah. convey information, you know, I know it's 
gets everything politically charged, like everything, even uh, these keys, I'm sure, are politically charged. You can find <laughs> something. So, uh, but like everything, even like the Roman Empire, at, at some point things will change. I uh, copy the link on uh, and put it on LinkedIn, uh, but I haven't tried other platforms. My kids want me badly to be on TikTok, but that's extremely addictive. And I don't know if this is our population of folks on uh, TikTok. That's so far, no. Well, I'll tell you what we'll do, Renu, because we, we've only started <laughs> doing TikTok recently for GUcast. So we're going to turn your top 10 papers from this podcast into uh, 10 TikToks for your, you can show it to your kids. Aye, aye, aye. There won't be any dancing or stripping or stuff like that, that you know, unless you really want to. Uh, but we will make you into a TikTok star before you know it. <laughs> Oh, yeah. No, that's, yeah, we can monetize that and pay for the kids' tuition. Mm. See, he's not worried about TikTok because he doesn't think he's suited for it. He's worried it's too addictive. That's right. He might get hooked. So That's true. Shall we, uh, <laughs> shall we dive into it, Renu? Um, and of course, being it's not just prostate cancer, of course. Um, it's uh, You've covered a, a fair swathe of GU oncology and yeah. you kick off with um, kidney cancer. Ki with, uh, so, cabozantinib plus nivolumab and ipilimumab in renal cell cancer. Tony, that's your first one, number one. And he's the PI. And, and you are uh, the PI. Yeah. In New England Journal, in New England Journal of Medicine, exactly. Just by, by luck, he had a PI. That's my conflict. I put it this because this was the first attempt in metastatic kidney cancer to push the envelope from two to three drugs, you know, at the dose of CABO40 and, um, and focus on the intermediate and poor risk population. Uh, so the result, while they're positive for progression-free sur survival, response rate um, was only numerically higher. There were higher toxicities, obviously three versus two drugs and the overall survival at the first interim analysis, which we haven't seen, we have a press release, was negative. So, um, you know, this is does not, at least till now, led to the approval of the three drugs, but an important lesson that we continue, um, you know, to try and take a seat back and see what happens. So that's why it made uh, the list, irrespective of the authorship. So, yes, yeah, so that's a COSMIC 313 trial, and it was it was presented at ESMO in 2022. Um, the great thing about your tweets, um, Tony, is that you, you summarize it brilliantly with, you know, a couple of Kaplan-Meier curves uh, that are yeah. relevant. So it really, um, it's really all you need to know about the trial. Can I ask you a question about, in general, the principle of combining more and more drugs in medical oncology? You're very familiar with it. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you, do you think we should always be seeing a significant OS benefit to balance off the inevitable um, toxicity, drug-related and financial toxicity of adding two, three very expensive drugs together? Should we always have an OS signal? I mean, I don't want to be like totally, you know, one way or another, but probably you add more drug, you expect more. Let's put it, you know, uh, that way. You, you expect more. So I think in this situation, if we had, a PFS that was double, even without an OS, uh, we had higher CRs, this was tolerated very well, even without an OS, it would get there, it, it wasn't the case, but, you know, when you pay more, uh, you expect more, and paying is paying in terms of adding drug, adding side effects, the financial toxicity, so that, in general, uh, what what I think. So at least the, the magnitude of the PFS should be greater to offset the greater toxicity. And preferably see OS as well. And in fact, of course, exactly. in, in, in many, and this is very similar for all the rest of the papers we discuss, is in, in very many countries around the world, um, governments will insist on OS as a kind of a basic thing, or let's wait for the OS, let's wait. But great study, great to test that principle. And of course, we will see um, OS readout when the data is more mature at some stage. Um, Prostate Number cancer two, revenue. Yeah, Talapro 2. It was yeah. a big highlight at uh, ASCO GU in 2023. Um, it's, a, it's a phase three trial looking at the HRR deficient MCRPC population. Yeah, I like this study very much. Mm. The reason why I highlighted, if you want, the nature medicine uh, part uh, of that study, that study led by um, Karim Fizazi and, and Niraj Agarwal, it just, it's uh, pulled... Uh, two uh, uh, part, two groups, the one with um, uh, HRR deficient, metastatic castration resistant uh, prostate cancer. And here clearly 
not just you see the PFS um, uh, uh, signal with a hazard ratio of 0.45, but you start seeing the OS perhaps materializing. It's a bit immature, but the confidence interval are up to 1.03. Uh, uh, there is also more price to pay. Telazapurib or PARP and PARP inhibitor in general have anemia, neutropenia, and fatigue. But that's an interesting, uh, uh, you know, combination. And I would love this to become really standard in this specific population, especially if OS become uh, significant. And there'll be more follow up here. I think, you know, with, with, you know, one failing immunotherapy trial after another in prostate cancer, I think what we've seen in the last couple of years is that PARP inhibition seems to be the future for, um, you know, this MCRPC population, especially that population with a mutational burden. Yeah, I think that's a question I'd ask Tony is that, you know, one of the, the striking things about this trial, of course, is it is a selected population. It makes sense kind of population with PARP inhibition to have these HR deficiencies. Can have you an overview of, of where you think we're at in, in 2024 about the use of PARP inhibition for selected versus unselected populations? Yeah, I mean, uh, people, some people based on other trial have really uh, given it in general, but at least at least in my practice on I would like to see, um, you know, HRR um, deficient tumor uh, that include BRCA1 and um, BRCA2 mostly, although there are some nihilists that really want to see just BRCA uh, positive tumor, which we know when we do that, the hazard ratio even gets um, uh, better and uh, better. And we know there are some mutations that are, uh, you know, considered that did not uh, even... Uh, uh, you know, uh, make it. The hazard ratio is around one, one, but they're lumped together. And let's not forget also the other problem, uh, which is a problem, is not just defining which one are the mutations that are most sensitive, is sometimes using uh, tissue versus liquid yes. biopsies that are gaining even more esteem and are easier. You don't, you don't have to go after the tissue, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it remains to be defined, but I think next generation of trials are going to be even more important. Fantastic. Yeah, very good. And Telepro is one that actually we've highlighted in a lot of local meetings as one of the highlights of 2023. Yeah, and Aruna's ad has been involved in some of yeah. these trials. Number three, onto another organ type, onto um, bladder mm -hmm. cancer. Really? Yes, so um, this is a combination of immunotherapy and chemotherapy for as first-line treatment for unresectable urothelial cancer, Tony. Yeah, no. Uh, so the, the third uh, paper here that I picked is also was highlighted at last year, uh, ESMO, the GEMSYS uh, plus minus um, uh, nivolumab uh, with uh, Matt Kalski and Van der Heiden. And uh, it was presented next to the biggest study of them all in the plenary session. And this was a study positive for PFS and OS. And who would have thought that how many, 25 or 30 years of gem cis, gem carbo first line will be completely, um, you know, uh, thrown away, if you want, in like 25 minutes, yeah. you know, both presentation, if you want, or 30 minutes uh, when gem cis Nevo, and that's why I highlighted that was published there and Pembro EV, um, mm -hmm. which is not, I didn't include it, and a lot of people jumped at me, why didn't you include it? I this is only the published, yeah. you yeah. know, yeah. studies, yeah. which will be probably the number one study in 2024. Yeah. But the study, Gemsys Nevo, showed superiority for uh, DFS, for overall survival, and a higher CR rate here. And, and that's a regimen, because I can tell you, I would love, and I don't have it in front of me, to compare the costs of GEMSYS NEVO versus uh, PEMBRO EV. And there are countries and uh, uh, w that don't have access to uh, EV. I was surprised to know recently that in Spain, you don't have it, I would say, reimbursed as a single agent. And I was like, I asked multiple times, and it seems that's the truth. So uh, adding nivolumab, which is, you know, widely approval, approved in terms of GEMSYS that exists everywhere, is very reasonable first line if you don't have Pembro EV. 
It, 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 this paper was mm. almost overshadowed at ESMO because of the Pembro EV paper and the sensational curves and so on, wasn't it? But I, I totally agree with your opening comment. It was this is a, this is a really really important landmark paper for people to recognise, mm. and it does reflect that landmark era we we're just going through, where bladder cancer is fundamentally changing with the these superb trials led by your colleagues. So yeah, and Pembro EV, of course, I'm, I'm sure that paper won't be long into 2024 before it breaks cover, and we'll look forward to getting Tom on for a chat about that yeah and uh, moving on it's been a biggie for urethral cancer so the next one is the phase three thor trial uh, and these are patients with urethral cancer with fgfr alterations tony yeah i think this is uh, also an important study just precision medicine at its best with uh, probably if you want the top alteration in bladder cancer that has a drug uh, fgfr 2 and 3 maybe around 15 percent uh, of all, um, you know, bladder cancers. And um, now this may not be the best. There is toxicity with erdafitinib, but let's say post-PD-1, which is a first line or at least the second line uh, compared to a chemotherapy in general, there is a, a PFS advantage and there is an OS, um, you know, advantage here of around uh, four, four and a half months favoring the FGFR um, inhibitor here. And the response rate, of course, including CR. The issue is when erdafitinib, despite this is a very important study, it reinforced when you have the FGFR, uh, you know, alteration uh, to use uh, erdafitinib. Uh, when uh, chemotherapy, when this drug was brought in earlier, uh, setting and this has been also another presentation i don't think the paper was published against immune checkpoint inhibitor there was no superiority so the control arm really uh, matters here yeah excellent Brilliant. Um, uh, and then number five, we're mm. getting halfway there. This is really important because this is looking at uh, non-clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Of course, big real, area of need. It is really, isn't it? You know, because so much focus on that, and you always have these non-clear cell metastatic patients going. Okay, what are the options? And it's nearly always trials. But this is um, keynote uh, B sixty one. Pem Len, uh, tell us a bit Pem about Len. that. Well, the whole non-clear cell is full of these uh, phase two study. We've seen cabozantinib, nivolumab. We've seen atezolizumab from our plays. We we almost seen them all, but this one, one of the last one, which is a phase two straight of um, uh, Pembrolan. You know that regimen first line is uh, you know very much uh, active, and um, uh, responses here uh, was seen uh, in all uh, uh, non-clear cell RCCs that were uh, you know included. Uh, one interesting uh, subtype is chromophobe, which we haven't seen responses to immunotherapy uh, at all. It's a very cold tumor. And even in cabozantinib nivolumab, uh, we haven't seen small number, with, but we've seen responses with uh, pembrolizumab and lenvatinib. Lenvatinib is a kind of a dirty uh, TKI here. So this is an ex extremely important um, I think um, regimen again would love to have seen control uh, here arm, but they're not happening. There is a study with IO VEGF that is enrolling in non-clear cell uh, renal cell cancer with a novel um, TKI as anzetinib XL092, also from XLXS plus nivolumab versus sunetinib. A lot of places don't have uh, IO in non-clear cell. Uh, another study also that Finnish accrual, I believe, and is expected with nivolumab, epilimab versus sunitinib. And another study from our uh, work with uh, Tom Powell's and other is a specific pure MET inhibitor, uh, savolitinib. So it doesn't have any VEGF inhibitor, and it's in MET positive patient, those 40% of patients that have alteration in MET, and they get durvalumab, savolitinib, durvalumab only, or sunitinib. Again, all these started bef at the same time or just before cabozantinib beats sunitinib in papillary renal cell cancer. So hopefully we'll have one randomized study. Always will make me, will make everyone feel a bit better. 
Yeah, it's great to have all those uh, early studies in these non-clear cells. But yeah, where is the big randomized trial? It's hard, isn't it? Because it's a, these are subsets. These are not the commonest type of kidney cancer. And and you mentioned that the PEMLEN, the, there isn't a phase there isn't a, a phase three randomized trial coming off the back of this. In one. non-clear cell, uh, no, there yeah. hasn't. Uh, much going on here. Is so that because that, it, it just isn't a big enough market to fund a you know a huge multi-million dollar trial uh, for for industry? Absolutely, and not even uh, enough uh, uh, enough patients. So we mm. you know yeah. have to go after this patient. Remember also uh, the pathology review is still you need really GU pathologist here. And while clear cell is as homogeneous as you can get, uh, you know there is no common. Um, biology uh, between let's say chromophobe and papillary then the unclassified is our uh, poor person attempt when we don't understand what the tumor is and emerging emerging a lot of emerging entities um, that come every couple of years um, with a translocation uh, the translocation which has more than one but also i'm just going back and forth um, um, uh, with with a novel entity, uh, the NF2 mutated renal cell uh, cancer, um, uh, BPH RCC, which is also um, you know emerging entity, and their biology and the underlying molecular abnormalities are totally different, and we're trying to learn one by one. So it's very hard to pinpoint everything in a randomized study. Sometimes phase two is are acceptable. Yeah. Five down, five to go, Renew. What yeah, are we back, back on to? Back to prostate cancer for paper number six. This is the phase three Embark trial for high risk biochemically recurrent prostate cancer and the role of enzalutamide. Yeah, no, I like this study. Now, mm. a lot of folks believe OS and prostate cancer go hand in hand. I don't know, uh, but uh, this is in patient with uh, uh, biochemical recurrence, but at risk, at higher risk of metastasis by the virtue yes. of having uh, a detectable PSA plus surgery or a PSA doubling time, usually in this paper less than nine months. And, uh, you know, using uh, LHRH, uh, you know, agonist versus uh, not versus uh, replacing this with uh, enzalutamide or adding enzalutamide, especially with all the uh, side effects that uh, many of us reported on with LHRH uh, agonist, but uh, we've seen a metastasis-free survival, not just with the combination over luprolide, but also with single agent enzalutamide. Yeah. I have to say, though, I was a bit surprised based on the biology that you would have a hazard ratio for metastasis-free survival 0.63 comparing enzalutamide monotherapy versus luprolide uh, alone. But that's the data. It definitely opens that conversation about using uh, monotherapy or pathway inhibitor. And of course, patients out there listening to this podcast, as many do, uh, who are experienced with ADT would be very attracted to the idea of not having ADT if necessary, especially in this early setting where they don't have metastases already. But Absolutely. but I think at ESMO, um, Steve Friedland read out the quality of life data from Embark as well um, at ESMO. And, um, and of course, everyone wanted to dive into that to see, okay, what about the monotherapy arm? And um, it, wasn't, it wasn't that impressive, was it? The difference between using only AD, only um, ENZA mono versus uh, combination? Um, uh, that is okay. That is totally true. When I looked, I wasn't very impressed. I was thinking, wow, this is going to be an easy sell. And I don't know if it's really not that much different, you would think, because, you know, yeah. someone you drop their testosterone quickly, or because our tools to capture, at least in the short term, quality of life are not great. I suspect there's a bit of that to it, isn't it? Surely, if I was being offered uh, Enza Mono versus ADT plus Enza, you know, I'd be very happy to take a take the Enza Mono based on this paper that you're discussing, the Union Journal Metastasis Free Survival paper, and not dive too deep into the quality of life. I must say, but yeah, absolutely, and, and I would love at least in the United States see the difference in the financial toxicity. You would assume enzalutamide is more expensive, but I don't know. I mean, uh, I I. I have to look into this, but coming, getting luprolide, not just the price, but also the injection, driving, all that. You know, I'm I'm not sure yeah. it is more uh, less expensive. So we are definitely getting patients asking about this because patients are very very aware of this discussion. So. 
Um, yeah, so good. Nice work from uh, Steve Friedland and Neil Shore and Definitely, everyone. Embark. Yeah. Uh, Next one's an interesting one, paper number seven. Uh, This is a phase one study. This is looking at a novel treatment, AMG 509 or Zaluritamig. Good job. Good job, Renee. Yeah, I feel that I you did so that I don't have to say it again. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's a steep one immunotherapy. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, In patients with MCRPC. So can you give us a layman's um, summary of this, Tony? Yeah, so uh, and, and castration is in prostate cancer. Step one is a target here, and uh, uh, xaluritamig, a drug from Amgen, it's a T cell engager that targets Step one. And uh, the paper was published. It's immunotherapy. Uh, it was published. Um, uh, you know, Kevin Kelly, Len Appleman, then Danila. It was published in Cancer Discovery. It was an oral presentation. The interesting thing about it is that in castration resistant prostate cancer, it's like you know the most common uh, cancer, uh, at least prostate cancer, not metastatic in men, we don't have many targets. We still hit on that androgen receptor and immunotherapy, at least in unselected uh, patient with pembrolizumab really failed miserably. So Mm -hmm. I would uh, suggest, because we didn't have a biomarker, we didn't plan biomarker, we didn't know what the biomarker are, but, that's why I thought having something new that is active. You look at these uh, waterfall plot. Uh, this is an active but a drug, but it does have toxicity. I don't know how the path uh, to develop this drug is uh, going to be later on, but this is something I did like very much. Yeah, it was the first in human studies, so congratulations to the team on that. And the fact they made it onto Tony Cherry's and Christmas yes, list means that it's caught his eye. You know, he's <laughs> not just list, yeah. pulling out the, all the big randomized trials. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, number upper eight, tracks. what are we up to? Upper tract. Upper thinking, tract. Great. Yeah, yeah, I was we were missing that. This is from MSK. Um, uh, it's a phase two trial. Um, neoadjuvant, neoadjuvant chemotherapy in, in high-grade upper tract urothelial cancer. We yeah, no, the gem, they use uh, gem cis, uh here, and Jonathan Coleman, Dean, Jonathan Rosenberg uh, published this. Um, it's actually a very good study focusing on upper track, which is very hard to uh, stage here, but uh, they've done a nice job. They felt that this is, you know, uh, tolerable doing, uh, doing it before um, uh, surgery. Um, which is when the kidney function is still uh, great and uh, can result in responders. And certainly if you are a responder, you are more likely to stay alive and uh, have a good PFS. And this is a, an investigator sponsor study that merits uh, uh, the highlight and kudos to the multi D team at um, MSK, which is, you know, outstanding team. And I mean, it, you know, and it's a, it's a huge team behind it, really a star-studded paper, actually. Um, and, you know, your upper tract urothelial is such a challenge because just staging it is so difficult. Um, and then to know who are the ones who should get neoadjuvant treatment is, is even more difficult. So how does that fit in, Tony? Are you embracing this um, at dana Farm? I am. Uh, you know, I embrace this when I can, and even if they get good kidney function, we were one of the first to publish well, those dense and vac neoadjuvant. So we're comfortable doing it. Of course, you have to be more careful in upper tract, because if you go to toxicity and then the patient goes to surgery, then the kidney function going to be a, an issue. Now that you have also adjuvant um, you know, therapy, and we can talk about that with nivolumab, although there is no overall survival benefit and an upper track. I don't like the forest plot, how things look, but again, very small subgroup analysis. But Pembro study um, ambassador is positive. I think we're going to see that very soon, but I like to see in these adjuvant IO studies, and I digress, sorry. I like to see OS because Pembro EV in metastatic is CR rate of close to 30%. You wonder if you don't have an OS benefit from adjuvant single agent PD-1, should you just, you know, wait, especially if you do ctDNA and give Pembro EV and maybe just maximize thing with gem Cisneo adjuvant uh, or dose dense MVAC. I, I think this is where multi-D and um, involving more than two oncologists uh, is, is important. 
Totally. Right. Great summary. Fantastic. Two to go. This was and a ne- uh, negative this trial. This is Monty Powell's um, yep. study, actually. So this is Contact 03. This is cabozantinib as um, uh, monotherapy versus atezolizumab plus cabozantinib for progressive RCC. Yeah, I, I, I highlighted this. And again, I've been involved in this with Monty Powell and, um, you know, Laurence Albigez and other one of the thing is, which we've seen in second opinion, people continuing um, continuing the immune checkpoint inhibitor and switching uh, on and on and on. We've seen it in renal, we've seen it in lung cancer, uh, we've seen it in melanoma. And uh, when we looked at the literature, uh, there was no randomized study, no phase three before uh, contact three in any tumor that we should do that. There are some re challenges that work, not work. Sometimes the patient would stop therapy because of toxicity. Sometimes there is long lag. So we designed a study where we said, at least here, we're going to do a TKI, second line, CABO, versus TKI plus a PD-1, PD-L1, not used, usually a TESO, because a TESO study didn't, despite, you know, that's an active agent, but the phase three hasn't, um, you know, materialized into an approval, despite was positive. Um, so we're going to do that and we're going to take patient whose tumor progressed, really had progression uh, on PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitor initially and just came off. And the result were kind of, I wouldn't say kind of very surprising, but also there was no signal of enhanced response, disease-free survival, overall survival, a bit more toxicity. We looked at independent central review. We looked at investigator assessment, zero, nothing. And uh, that began the question whether we should do that. Remember, I don't need to tell you, but remember when bevacizumab started the, the first target drug, and whenever we had an approval, we kept sometimes bevacizumab on board, if at least in the US we can get away with the insurance, because what if, what if, you know, and, you know, it's a bit different. We have another study in renal cell uh, using nivolumab, a PD-1 inhibitor with tivazanib, another TKI study finish enrollment called TNIVO2, and hopefully we'll know the result this year or next year. Fantastic. And it, you know, goes to show that negative trials are important. Not only do they make it into very high impact journals, but also Tony's list. Well, it's, it's also. And I important. think that's one of the reasons why it made it to to mm. to Lance. That's you know where we haven't seen um, you know much, and I don't think PD one and PDL one inhibitor and other PD one among themselves are necessarily interchangeable. Yeah. Yeah. And the way you described the, the results, clearly there was some surprise among the investigators, but that's the whole point of designing a good trial is to challenge our own assumptions. And exactly. it's really important. That's why negative trials don't get enough attention and often don't, well, some of them don't even get into press or they don't get enough uh, into the right sort of press. But um, that's why it's really important that you've taken a view to highlight something here because there are lessons for the, the clinical research community in these trials, Absolutely. of course, Tony. Yeah. yeah. And we're yeah, thrilled no, no. that Letitia in PSMA has made your list, uh, yeah, Tony, with paper number 10. This is a phase one trial from UCSF, uh, published in Lancet Oncology, uh, looking at single-dose Letitia in PSMA um, in patients with MCRPC, followed by PEMBRO maintenance. Yeah, I get a lot of grief for this. <laughs> I was accused of uh, overloving the Australian or the people from the West Coast, why phase one, look at this phase three, what did you do? I said, no, this is very important. First, it's doable. Second, uh, you know, immunotherapy remains important. Is this the way how you could marry immunotherapy to um, radioligand uh, therapy? And maybe you could put uh, pembrolizumab first. I don't know if the sequence was the right one, followed by radioligand therapy and by some time, but I was quite, um, you know, interested in the activity, the fact that it was, you know, uh, and priming makes a lot of sense here. Uh, we haven't done that in, in a different way. So I think this is uh, promising, and I hope that group follows on this with a randomized study. There might be something. I am not totally sure about that. Need to ask Dr. Hope, Tom Hope, and, um, you know, other uh, friends and collaborators from Australia. Yeah, um, maybe we'll get Rahul on to talk about it because there's a trial that has been running at Peter Mac for a few years, a very similar trial called Prince Trial, led by Shanine uh, Sandu and Michael Hoffman, but that hasn't 
hit the papers yet so mm. we, that must be due as well but uh you know it's everyone trying to flog that dead horse of immunotherapy and prostate cancer tony as you know one of our favorite topics if we give a bit of magic lutetium will that make the uh, io work ne- you never know maybe it will um, <laughs> it's, excuse my usual skepticism <laughs> again i know no. um but yeah it, it is very nice work isn't it and um uh, in fact rahul was down here last year talking about something differently but we should get him himself get him back on. yeah yeah Absolutely. Is that, is that ten papers? Ten papers. Well, congratulations to all those uh, group of authors who made Tony's list, and yeah. I love that comment at the end. It's clearly a bit. Con- why am I on your list? Or why is yeah? On like your list? why don't you like what's going on, <laughs> etc. And uh, you know, I uh, I get also emails uh, from good friend Tom Powers. Like what I said, Tom, only the published studies. Like no, you have things against the UK. You're pro. So I'm like <laughs> oh. no, no, no. This is my list. I need to put the uh, conflict of interest. You know, everyone, like I get those emails. The, the worst one is when they did the whole um, uh, all cancer. And then, you know, there are a lot of, I would say, Me Too, you know, <laughs> papers, which we put the one perhaps in the higher impact journal or the one that got the FDA approval uh, for that condition. And of course, uh, I get there uh, way more um, hate emails. So maybe next time I'll do the top 15. Uh, but then, you know, if you're ranked 16, what can I do? In in five years, it'll be the top uh, 50, yeah. Tony. I can <laughs> stick, with, stick with the top And then 10. a link to all the journals with free subscription. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's not an exhaustive list and there's been some fantastic papers. So congratulations to, to everyone. But new challenge for 2024, do good quality research, make Tony's list. Exactly. And and finishing up, Tony, um, we're just a couple of weeks out from ASCO GU. Um, I'm not going, you're going. I'll be right there. Now. So I'm waiting to hear, Tony, Keynote yeah. 564. Oh, yeah. We, it will be there. I think uh, we would love to have you on a podcast. Just don't put me with Alex Kutigov again. <laughs> I can't. I, I can't. I mean, just get me someone easy, like like Ben Davis. I can. T- <laughs> no, no. We th- that was one of the highlights of that year is when yourself and Alex Kudakov came on to talk about your uh, original readout uh, of Keynote Five Six Four, and we wiped the floor. We- I mean, that was like bloodbath. But um, you know, I think as you know, it was a press release, the first yeah. adjuvant study ever to have an OS benefit. Yeah. We're gonna look at the magnitude, at the benefit, have some updated results, and. Um, you know, enjoy some uh, good time was uh, in San Francisco. Yeah, Fantastic. look, that's a, a, one of the big, big highlights big highlight. um, yeah. and many other highlights. But congratulations. We look forward to that. And finally, I know you're a big football fan, of course. Um, so any 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 tips for the European leagues? Uh, who's who's going to be who's going to win the Champions League, for example? No, it's it's Liverpool. I think Arsenal way, you know, after Thierry Henry um, many years ago, they choke. It's going to be Liverpool and Manchester City. I think Villa is for real. That's going to be Liverpool, Manchester City. Man United is a second-tier team now. It's unfortunate. But these are my, uh, you know, two cents about it. So, <laughs> hopefully. I want to also take two, two seconds to recognize um, ends up. And, uh, you know, um, and my good friend Ian Davis and all of you who do trials that are extremely hard to do in other countries. And you set the bar very, very high. And you continue to be very productive and in some occasion doing studies that other folks um, you know uh, cannot do so also congratulations yeah here here um, and, and we did some good congress highlights from ends up this year yeah tony, tony was telling us before and he hasn't physically been to australia which i find hard to oh, believe but um, <laughs> ends up run a really good annual scientific meeting and um, uh, i'm sure ian and co might have you on the roster maybe they've invited you already it's difficult to take all the invitations yes, they, 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 do you know were, tony uh, in uh, at ends up this year declan and i had a debate about adjuvant immunotherapy for renal cancer that's right <laughs> yeah and it was based if on Kino five six four was out i would have won easily yeah, you did. Yeah, win. hopefully <laughs> renal will not be any more discussed. It will be bladder because I think in bladder we're still waiting for OS. If I'm yeah. not wrong, yes, yeah. we are. Yeah, fantastic. Look, excellent. Great to see you. Um, uh, thanks very much for joining us, and congrats on this great list. We love disseminating it to an even wider audience than the big audience you already have. Um, and look, uh, uh, I look forward to seeing you at ASCO GU, Tony. Yeah, perfect. See you. Thank you again. Bye. Terrific. That's all we have time for um, on this episode of um, GU Cast. That was fun, Renew. Good start. Yeah, the look back on 2023 before we move forward. Exactly. It's going to be an exciting year for us. It will be. And uh, Renew will bring some ASCO GU highlights in a few weeks. And we've got a few other great episodes coming up as well. So do stay tuned. Do get in touch as usual. And uh, we look forward to a really good upcoming year of podcasting here at GU Cast. Thank you for your support. <laughs>